I don't want to get in trouble, I'm sure. She's with you, I'm sure. He's somewhere, so. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you everybody for coming. It's really a, a great pleasure. And an, uh, I'm Tim Fry, the director of the Harriman Institute. For those of you who don't know me, uh, uh, it's great pleasure and honor to have uh, Boris Nimsov here um, uh, speaking, uh, fresh off his uh, trip to Washington. Uh, doesn't need much of an introduction. He's a former governor, uh, former uh, deputy prime minister, former uh, deputy speaker of the House, former advisor to, to form, president. Form. For, for, uh, former uh, the advisor to President Yushchenkov. So for those of you interested in Ukraine, uh, uh, feel free to ask questions uh, about that as well. And currently, one of the leading opposition figures uh, in political circles uh, within Russia. And what we thought we would do today is to uh, uh, just have really an открыта беседа, just an open question and answer session. Uh, I'll ask uh, Boris the first question if he has any uh, opening remarks. Uh, and then we'll open up the floor. And, and since we are taping, and video uh, taping, uh, if you would come up and, and ask your question into the microphone, and uh, just so that everybody knows uh, that we are videotaping, this, uh, uh, you're asking a question implies your consent. So uh, uh, thanks for uh, just abiding by those uh, small rules. And uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Boris Nimsov to the microphone, and just uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, uh, what you were doing in Washington recently and any impressions that you might have. So first of all, let me, uh, let's have a warm welcome for Boris Nimsov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for everybody. Well, first of all, I'm happy that there are, there are a lot of Russians here, including my old friend Andronik Migranian. I don't know where is Andrei. He disappeared. Oh, no. <laughs> it's great, yeah. Uh, well, because mainly we are under discussion in Moscow for, for many, many years, but uh, now he decided to teach Americans what does mean real democracy. That's why he preferred to stay in the States. Well, and I met with a lot of other Russians. And Denis Morozov, he's my friend. He's here. It's great. Well, thank you very much for everybody. Well, uh, really, I just a few hours arrived to New York City. I spent two days in Washington, D.C. Um, yesterday it was a Memorial Day in the Congress. Um, this day was devoted to Sergei Magnitsky tragedy. Maybe you know that he died one year ago in the prison. He was uh, a lawyer and he was uh, involved in anti-corruption um, case against some officials inside eternal, uh, Russian internal affairs. Um, and we discussed with Senator Cardin uh, about his proposal, I mean his act, justice for Sergei Magnitsky. Um, I strongly support this project. The main idea is to include 60, to include 60 officials who are responsible for his death, including investigators, including judges, including uh, administration of Butyrka and Matroska Tishina, this is two famous Russian Moscow prisons. Well, I think that what is said is that during the last one year, nothing happened with investigation. Nobody knows who was responsible for his death. He was a very young man, just 37. Well, that's why somebody asked why Americans decided to be involved in this uh, problem. Uh, my answer is because a Russian official did nothing. That's why Senator Cardin suggested this act, and um, we talked about that. Um, I met with Michael McFall, who is uh, President Obama advisor to Russia. I know him for many, many years. He's a brilliant man who knows Russia, and I can tell you that he feels Russia, because knowledge is not enough to understand what does it mean Russian events and what's happening in my country. And um, Michael feels Russia, which is, which is great. 
And he was in the Congress uh, yesterday evening too, and he supported this act. And I think that this is important because he is official from the White House. Well, I met with Senator McCain. Um, we talked about START Treaty, about WTO at Jackson Vanek. Um, my uh, personal view on the subject is that, of course, Jackson Vanek has to be cancelled because this is from dinosaur era from Soviet Union. The, the main act was adopted when there were a problem of Jewish immigration in the Soviet Union. Soviet Union collapsed. Problem of immigration, fortunately, has already solved many, many years ago in Gorbachev era and Yeltsin. That's why Jackson Vanek has to be cancelled. On the other hand, and I think that sanctions against the country, uh, this is very inefficient idea, and the most efficient is sanctions against some people who broke constitution, who broke human rights and democracy. That's why my proposal to Michael McFall and my proposal to McCain and uh, to Senator Cardin was... Uh, to adopt new act support Russian democracy and the main idea is to include to this act persons who are responsible for censorship in Russia who are responsible for human rights violations who are responsible for breaking elections in the country we have unfortunately false ele elections fraud election, what do, what do you want to say? Well, and to put to this blacklist, what I mean is canceling visa to the United States, some problems with assets and accounts, the same like Cardin suggested for investigators uh, of Magnitsky. I think that, first of all, this is not against the country. I think that we have to protect our country and to protect our relationship with the states but this is against absolutely concrete persons who are responsible for dictatorship, who are responsible for corruption, who are responsible for breaking human rights. I think that this idea will be modern, and I hope that uh, people in the Congress and in the American administration will think how to do it. Well, as far as... Um, start treaty is concerned. My idea that the best way for everybody is uh, ratification. Because ratification means reduction of weapons and means transparency and control. What is good news is that McCain believes in that. Senator McCain from Republican part, he said that yes, we support an idea of ratification I say, and I think that this is very, very good news and I hope that new Congress will do this. As far as WTO, um, American administration supported uh, Russia to be joined to WTO, which is very good. Well, uh, and I think that joining Russia to WTO is what we need. Uh, not only, uh, nevertheless, who is Mr. Putin? Uh, authoritarian or not, because liberalization of foreign trade is in the, the interest to Russian people and in the interest for global economy. On one side, secondly, uh, membership in WTO means that uh, it will be more transparent rules for custom administration, reduction of corruption, which is very important, and uh, I want to tell you that uh, it doesn't matter who is in Kremlin. I think that involvement Russia to the global economy is good. It's a good idea for, for strategic point of view, not for tactical point of view. Uh, um, I took part in the conference uh, in Russian session. 
conference which was organized of foreign policy initiative. This is new organization from Washington. Well, and uh, I talked with uh, American experts and Russian <laughs> um, about what a position in Russia uh, should do in upcoming elections of 2011 and 2012. Good news is that, uh, and unique, I think, that we agreed to organize coalition with four organizations, with Kostyanov movement, with Rishkov Republican Party, and with Milov. Um, and Solidarity, I represent Solidarity. We sign an agreement about coalition in the middle of September. And now we are under preparation for uh, the Congress, which will happen in December 13. Um, we want to take part in the parliamentary elections and presidential. As far as presidential election is concerned, we understand all of the, all of the difficulties. I can tell you that there are 47 opportunities to reject candidate from the race, 47 according to Putin law. That's why, for example, you have to collect two million signatures to be registered, and if some signature uh, made a mistake, it's enough to reject you from, from campaign. Well, this is very, very democratic Putin idea, which was implemented uh, a few years ago. But anyway, uh, our response is, first of all, to nominate the united opposition candidate. Uh, during the last 20 years, we talked about the united opposition candidate, and nothing happened because of ego, because of contradiction between leaders, because of I don't know what. But now, fortunately, maybe because of Putin and Putinism, uh, now we came to the conclusion, and I believe that this the United candidate from opposition side will be uh, nominated in the Congress. Congress uh, we want to organize in June next year. And it will be like primaries, but not American, of course, primaries. It will be Russian primaries. All of the group who are a member of coalition will uh, take part in the Congress, equal amount of um, voters, plus uh, human rights protesters, plus uh, uh, the most uh, powerful and important people from democratic side who are not a member of our organizations. Uh, I think that such kind of, uh, and of course um, nomination will happen because of elections on this con con Congress, and I believe that this procedure is very important, and what is important that uh, this procedure does not depend on Putin and the power which is good. Well, as far as parliamentary election is concerned, according putin Surkov rules, just parties can take part in the elections. No coalition, no blocks, nothing. No movements. Well, to register party means to collect 45,000 members, and after that special guys will check all of the signatures, and I want to tell you that this check-in is a very, very tricky thing. For example, in elections in the Moscow Duma, my signature, uh, they said that this is fraud, my own signature. When I suggested them to resign, they asked, no, no, we have already made the decision. Well, uh, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Yashin, who is my friend, a young guy, 27 years old, who is a member of Solidarity too, uh, they said that 104% of signatures are false. 104%. When we ask how it's happened, they ask, it doesn't matter. Well, that's why, anyway, uh, we have to, uh, we have to do everything to be registered and uh, I want to tell you that if Putin and Surkov reject, will reject uh, our party, it means that this is not an election. Once again. 
Well, because election without opposition, this is not an election. I understand that they built a one-party system, and we are in the absolutely typical corrupted police state. We understand that. Uh, but on the other hand, we have no choice. We have to fight. We don't want to immigrate even to such brilliant city like New York. <laughs> well, that's why the only way for us is to fight in upcoming elections, uh, 2011 and 2012. Well, um, and last maybe point, you know that Speaker of the State Duma, Mr. Grislov, who is a member of Putin party, the United Russia, said that the parliament is not a place for discussion. He is a speaker, right? I want to tell you that not only the parliament is not a place for discussion, but even Putin's Russia is not a place for discussion. That's why the only way to be listening and the only way to achieve something is to go to the streets. I'm not a very young guy. I'm 51. I started my career from opposition to the Communist Party when I was a very young boy. Uh, well, it was quite understandable. Now to go to Triumphalne Square on the 31st of December or October, maybe it's easy for Yashin and for Milov, but for me this is a problem, right? <laughs> but there is no chance. For, because all of the politics in my country are in the streets. And this is quite effective politics, I want to tell you. Just a few examples. Uh, we organized Kaliningrad rally against corrupted governor Boas, is his name. And uh, 12,000 of demonstrators took part in this rally in the end of January this year. And finally, after six months, he was fired by the President Medvedev. Well, second, maybe you know this terrible story about Himki Forest. Uh, uh, our rock and roll star, Yuri Shevchuk, and opposition, including Solidarity, organized rally in the Pushkin Square with 5,000 participants. <coughs> Immediately after that, the President Medvedev stopped this cutting of the forests immediately. Third example, which is not well known throughout, the, throughout even Russia and the world, is we stopped uh, Deribaska chemical production in Abakan, which is in Siberia, in Hakassia. We organized rally about 7,000 of people, and after that immediately they stopped uh, to uh, to operate this chemical factory, which is very dangerous for health. That's why street policy is what we can do, and which is very efficient. I can tell you that maybe a few years ago it was difficult even to imagine that, for example, 5,000 of people will be in the street in Moscow, first of all. But now it's quite realistic. Because step by step, Russian people recognize what does it mean Putin, what does it mean Putinism, etc. People understand that this is corrupted state, and his very close friends became billionaires immediately after he became the president. We describe this in our very well known in Russia, maybe known some somebody in New York City book, which is Putin Itogi Desit Let. Uh, this is one million copies. We distributed it mainly in Russia, just few in New York City. Well, well, and we describe what's happened in corruption, not in the level of hospitals on kindergartens, the rust, such kind of low-level corruption, huge. But we describe what's happened, for example, with um, Mr. Kovalchuk, who is very close to Putin, and who. Uh, started his career from very small um, St. Petersburg Bank. Now he controls $60 billion of Gazprom assets, including the second bank of Russia, Gazprom Bank, including um, the most powerful pension fund, Gas Fund, 
including insurance companies, so gas, etc. These assets disappeared from Gazprom without any investigation and any explanation. Another example is his coaches of judo, brothers Rotenbergs. This is new generation of oligarchs. Well, they were great coaches maybe, but now they are a biggest supplier of pipeline to Gazprom. They control all of the construction businesses around Gazprom, and they are responsible for private uh, construction of the road Moscow-St. Petersburg, and they are involved in the scandal in Himki. Uh, these two brothers are in the uh, list of billionaires officially, like Kovalchuk, right? And the last example, which is great, is Timchenko. He was a very small trader of oil uh, when Putin was a deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. Even in '99, he uh, he published his declaration. He immigrated from uh, Russia to Finland and published declaration in Finland. His declaration was half a million dollar. In 2005, he appeared in Forbes magazine with $3 billion, and he controls more than 35% of oil exports from Russia, being a citizen of Finland, and have apartments in Geneva. Well, the main his achievement is that he's Putin friend. Well, uh, he decided to go to the Russian court to discuss our description in this book. I am very happy about that because it will be the first case in the modern history when corruption around Putin will be under court discussion in Russia. You know what does it mean Russian court, Basmanne, Pravasudia, what's happened with Khodorkovsky, etc. But we do everything to make it publicly and to explain people what does it mean real Putin and Putinism and uh, what is prospective for Russia if he will be once, once again in Kremlin office. Well, um, <clears throat> I think that our activity will increase. First of all, I mean rally demonstrators uh, because, um, you know, upcoming elections are important and important for Russian future. Uh, the most important question is what's happened uh, in, of course, in 2012. That's why to sit still and do nothing. Maybe in New York City this is a good idea. In, in Moscow, no. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, I think that questions will be great. Yeah, if, uh, you could come up to the, to the microphone uh, to ask your question in part because we are uh, May I ask a question? Who understands Russian? Can you raise a hand? <laughs> я понял, да. <laughs> я знаете, я как-то я, <laughs> я как-то выступал в Бостоне. <laughs> я читал лекции в Гарварде, выступал в Бостоне. И вот так люди слушали, слушали мой английский. Потом один из них говорит: "Боря, хватит выпендриваться". <laughs> я вот чувствую аудиторию примерно такая же. And, Huh? No, 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 no. I will continue to speak English. Don't worry. I, I just, uh, well, well. <laughs> this is like, this is for relaxation. No. Yeah, okay. Question in Russian or in English? Uh, <laughs> just uh, uh, say who you are and then ask your question. Uh, Alexey Larionov, um, two short questions, uh, probably in English. Um, uh, Boris Ivanovich, what do you think was the true reason of um, Lushkov's? Um, leaving his post, the first question. And the second question, will um, Milov run uh, for president? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you are involved in our <laughs> domestic event. That's great. Uh, well, uh, first question, Lushkov. Um, unfortunately, he was fired not because he's corrupted. Corruption is not a reason to be fired in Putin country. Well, that's very important to, to understand. He was fired because he didn't believe that Medvedev is a real president. I want to tell you that he is not unique. Millions of Russians think so. And not only Russians, but Americans. 
Well, and I think that the biggest mistake of Lushkov was that he didn't listen to Medvedev, and he openly showed that, openly showed that, you know, uh, his boss is Putin, and Putin will be in the office in 2012, and of course Medvedev is weak, that's true, but not so weak to pay no attention to such kind of demarche, right? That's why um, he was fired. What is important and what is sad story, that Sabanin, I suggested him to start investigation. What's happened during 18 years of Lushkov in, in the Moscow office, right? He's like Brezhnev, not only looking like, but Brezhnev was honest comparing with Lushkov, completely honest. Well, angel. Well, but I want to tell you that uh, I was sure that they started an investigation how his wife became billionaire, three billion dollars, right? Well, but nothing happened. And Sabanin didn't even mention such kind of investigation, which is terrible sign. Why terrible? Because Sabanin's wife is involved in construction business too. And once again, maybe not now, some years later, we will get the same. Well, uh, moreover, you know that Baturina was arrested for one night in London. And it will be a terrible story if British police will investigate corruption case, not Russian. This is against Russian interests. And I suggested many, many times, guys, I published not Putin itogi, but before that Lushkov itogi. 400,000 copies we distributed in Moscow subways. And uh, it was very important, you know. Lushkov and Baturina came to the court. It was 25, 25 discussion in the court against me. Final great news from Russia that I won Baturina. I was rare bird. I'm a single person in the world who won Baturina. Right? And she said that all of these corruption cases which you described are on. This is manipulation. This is not true, etc. I won. Uh, as far as Lushkov, Nemtsov discussion is concerned, now we are in Strasbourg. Unfortunately, bu bureaucracy in Strasbourg is even higher than in Russia, and we have to wait. But I'm sure that if Lushkov will be okay, I will win once again. Well, uh, I think that the most important is ignoring of conflict of interest and ignoring of um, anti-corruption law, which exists in Russia. They didn't even pay any attention about that. The last decision which Lushkov made was частно государственное партнерство between Lushkov and his wife. Officially, he was ready to spend four billion dollars from budget to help her wife to build private property in the heart of Moscow city, in the western side of Moscow city. Four billion from budget, and nobody responds on that. Investigators with whom I uh, am in connection, they said they, they prepared all of the materials, but no demand from Putin. They are waiting for demand from Putin. Why Putin is so cautious about that? Because he knows that if he starts from Lushkov, the second will be Kavalchuk, after that Timchenko, after that brothers Rottenberg, and finally Putin. That's why to cover all of this corruption is a principle of Putin, because corruption and Putinism is the same. This is absolutely the same. This is definition. If you are talking about Putinism, you are talking about corruption. And the main goal of existing bureaucrats in Russia is to steal money. That's why I suggested this act to protect democracy in Russia and try to 
to arrest assets. This is very painful for corrupted bureaucracy. For Stalin bureaucracy, it's nothing. They were not corrupted. For Putin bureaucracy, this is everything. Because the main dream is to go to the south of France or to Mr. Abramovich to London, you know, Chelsea, whatever, maybe some boats, private planes, you know, some uh, stores in Paris or in Milan or in London. This is the main goal of existing bureaucrats. Secondly, about Milov, my friend. You know, first of all, he's my co-author, right? Well, and he's really very young, very strong guy, modern. Uh, he uh, started his political career less than three years ago. Well, from our first report, Putin and Togi. Well, now he's a leader of choice of, uh, democratic choice of Russia, right? Um, he was nominated from his movement a few days ago, but this is not nomination to the candidate, but this is nomination to candidate to be candidate. Well, because uh, he, he decided to take part in our primaries, which I described before. In the Congress in June, he will take part. That's, that's great news, you know. It will be competition. Competition is what we need. Uh, Natalia Pelevina, what can in real terms break the back of this regime, in your opinion? And also, I was just in Moscow just a few weeks ago, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction with what's going on among common people. I talk to a lot of people, and they're unhappy. But what, in, again, in practical terms can people do to support the opposition or at least go against the current system? Stand yeah. up to it. Thank you. Natalia, I understand you, and I don't know anybody in Moscow who support Putin. But if you look at public pools, uh, about 70% of Russians support him. This is strange uh, for first uh, observation. But my understanding is that, first of all, um, he's a lucky man. Because privatization happened in the, tw the end of 20th century. Uh, all of the dirty job uh, was done by Yeltsin and his team. Well, we, uh, he got real market economy, well, of course, with problems, with monopolization, corruption, etc., but open market, free currency, etc. Well, second point, very expensive oil. Uh, I want to tell you that when I was a minister of fuel and gas, oil prices were $10. I had a dream to get finally 20 I was sure that if we'll get 20, we'll be like the United Arab Emirates. Now Putin has approximately about 90, and we face budget deficit about 3.5%, because he built corrupted state, which is very expensive, and police state. You know, If you have police guide more than 2 million in the country, twice more than in the army, and uh, you have to spend money for to support that. Well, uh, and second uh, reason why he's popular, regardless what your friends are talking about, is propaganda machine. He built not stupid propaganda machine. Um, he established 100% censorship on TV. For example, I'm strictly forbidden on federal channels, strictly. Um, even when Chernomerden died, they wanted to show a film about Chernomerden. And I was a deputy prime minister when he was prime minister. They made decision to show me, but just about Chernomerden. It was very top level decision. It was a real achievement to overcome censorship. It's happened. I'm very happy. But if you uh, want to talk about, for example, corruption or situation in the North Caucasus or relationship between Putin and Abramovich or Putin and Deripaska, etc., all of these topics are strictly forbidden. But a uh, PR campaign uh, is organized by Surkov. He's responsible for image of Putin and Medvedev. And uh, in this point of view, he did a good job. 
I can tell you, this is this job is against Russian interests, but he did a good job uh, for his point of view, first of all. Well, and this is a second reason why he's popular. But step by step, people are tired. People understand that this is absence of rules of law. There is no court in the country, independent court. Uh, people understand what's happening around Putin. Uh, what's happening around every governors and every mayors in the country. And that's why um, uh, popularity of opposition will raise step by step, but not very quickly, I want to tell you. Well, um, what should be done? I, I explained that, first of all, we have to we have to explain people what does mean Putinism. That's why one million copies. And we uh, uh, discovered so-called new summers that New summers that is a combination of printing material and, and internet. It works. It works very well. We check it when uh, I started anti-corruption campaign against Lushkov. It works very well. Even if they show that I'm American spy, that American uh, State Department gave me a lot of money, billions of dollars, where is this money? Nobody knows. But, but uh, now, uh, regardless of propaganda machine, you know, people understand that this is tricky and wrong. Well, it's a first. Second is street activity, and third is participation in the elections to explain people what is wrong and what is our strategy, what is our proposal, what is our alternative. That's that's why we have to explain people. Well, of course, if, if you are in the huge country like Russia with 142 million of people, well, uh, absence of Information resources are a serious problem, uh, but internet is free. Fortunately, not every uh, website, but um, a lot of, for example, Live Journal is free, uh, Nemtsov that is free, Kasparov that is free, and some others like Granny, etc. Uh, unfortunately, censorship exists in the most popular website like Mail that and uh, Yandex and Rambler. Uh, who cover about 75% of internet market in Russia, but the rest is free, which is good. Second, we have few regional um, media, few. I can tell you maybe 10 TV channels in such regions like Kastroma, like Vladimir, uh, one in Krasnoyarsk. I know everybody. Well, and uh, some newspapers. And we have newspapers, not very popular newspapers, but influential, like Commerçant, like Vedomosti, like Nova Gazeta, where Anna Politkovska worked for, for many, many years. That's why such kind of instruments are very important for future, um, for future campaign. And we will use it, of course. Maria Galvanieska, Open Society Institute. I have two questions. So I want to speak to your point about street protests and the power of them, and I completely agree. And um, as you may or may not know, uh, Russia right now is experiencing severe interruptions in HIV treatment, and HIV activists all over Russia have been have taken to the streets, and this has happened in Kaliningrad and Kazan and St. Petersburg and Moscow. And HIV activists in Moscow, for example, have chained themselves to the Ministry of Health and Social Development. And the Ministry of Health continues to ignore the problem. So my question is, what do you think needs to happen in order for the Ministry of Health and Social Development to acknowledge the problem and to address it? Or is the only way to solve this basically is to go directly to the president? And my second question is about the Transneft corruption scandal, which oh, yeah. broke out yesterday. Um, considering the yeah. magnitude... Where is Navalny? <laughs> he knows better. Yeah, I know, but considering the magnitude and the scope, do you think <laughs> the government's going to be able to ignore that? Thanks. Wow. Well, um, HIV problem is really very serious in Russia. And in every modern country, there are special health program for them, for such kind of people. And we have in Russia, too. But um, I think that the only way is mass protest. If you just, if you organize demonstration with few guys, three, five, nobody cares about that. If you collect, for example, 500, it will be a real problem for them. 
and plus you need press internet uh, maybe um, some representative from independent media like Nova Gazeta etc right that that's very important very very crucial the second opportunity is uh, to go maybe to Mr. Fedotov do you know Mr. Fedotov Mikhail Mikhail Fedotov who was a minister of press in the Yeltsin time now he's responsible for civil society after Panfilova, he is a good guy and he is a friend of mine. Well, and if it will be a chance to go to Medvedev, this is great. Fortunately, Medvedev mainly spent time in internet. That's why you can write him. He is famous Russian blogger. Well, and Twitter. Now, he, you know, he, when he met uh, Schwarzenegger in California, he talked a lot on Twitter about Silicon Valley, about uh, Gamburger in McDonald's and whatever. That's why information about him appeared in Twitter. That's why if you write him, maybe it will be quite useful. And your second question about Transneft, right? This is, first of all, terrible story. On the other hand, this is typical story. I think that the same corruption exists not only in Transnev, but, for example, in Gazprom. Well, because if you look at the cost of gas, cost, I mean production cost, during the last 10 years, production cost increased five times in U.S. money. And if you look at employees, they, you know, generate a lot of jobs in Gazprom. Well, they don't think how to save money, how to pay more taxes. Gazprom is offshore company in my country. They pay five times less than Lukoil in terms of what ton of, of equal, right, uh, fuel. That's why um, this is systematic problem. The next point is nothing happened as far as inv investigation is concerned. Shotna Palata investigated everything published report. After that, this report became secret. Yes, Alexei Navalny, he is a great guy, he is a friend of mine, he did very important anti-corruption investigation, but he is an independent person. Now he is in the States, in the Yale University. Well, and nobody responds. The same thing happened with that. Absolutely the same. If I publish information, for example, I publish information that Lushkov organized tender to uh, reconstruct Rabochi i Kalhoznica. Do you know Rabochi i Kalhoznica? Famous Stalin monument, which we established in Paris in 1937, and now it became a symbol, symbol of, of communism. And it was a very talented monument, right? Like status of uh, liberty here. Well, he organized tender for renovation. In the few hours before New Year, in 2008, a few hours before New Year, in the website of Moscow government, it's a piece, at 8 o'clock, December 31, tonight. At 10 o'clock, information disappeared, but one participant appeared, his wife. Ten, one month later, Lushkov signed a contract with his wife. They started from $80 million for renovation, which is not small money, but they signed a contract for more than 100 million. I describe all of that in this, in this book, not in this in Lushkov at Togi, right? And send it to Putin and to our investigators. What is the response? Nothing. Can you imagine that Michael Bloomberg organized tender for renovation of status liberty and his girlfriend will win this tender? What's happened with this gentleman a few minutes after that? He will be in jail immediately. Nothing happened. The same with uh, Weinstock, who was a former manager of Transneft. The same. Everybody knows. Everybody knows about that. This is not new information. It's happened a few years ago. And Putin knows about that. And Tokarev, new manager of Transneft, KGB general, he knows about that. No investigation at all, because this is a system. Putinism means corruption. 
If you break corruption, you break Putin. I explain you why corruption is so important for him. Because he built so-called vertical of the power, right? And he needs very loyal bureaucrats from the top to the bottom, very loyal. How to make bureaucrats loyal? How to make them loyal? The best way, if all of them are corrupted, and there are a lot of opportunity to take you to the prison, if you will make your independent view on the subject. That's why to build vertical of the power and to control the country means to corrupt everybody around. If you want to start anti-corruption campaign, really, not blah, 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 like Medvedev did, but really, what does it mean? You break vertical of the power, and this is the end of Putin. And finally, people ask, what's happened with your friends? Great national leader, what's happened with your friends? Let me investigate what's happened. This is the end of the story. That's why all of these cases concerning Transneft, Gazprom, concerning, you know, everything, Lushkov, will be out of discussion, out of public discussion. I mean not internet, I mean, first of all, TV and popular newspapers, uh, up to the end of Putin era. After Putin, everything will be understandable and clear. But the first goal is how to resign him, right? This is my main goal, resignation of Putin. Not because, nothing personal, right? He built corrupted police state, which is against Russian interest. And he wants to rule the country up to 2024, which is disaster for Russia. This is not even Brezhnev. Listen, this is not stagnation. This is real, very aggressive Police corrupted state, cynical, with atmosphere of hatred, serious. This last case with journalists, Alek Kashin, it's happened not because, you know, he criticized somebody, etc. This is an atmosphere of hatred, which was created by this gentleman. All of the journalists who have independent view, they are enemies. Do you know that in Kremlin website, of uh, Putin Hunwebin, the young guard of the United Russia, Maladaya Gvardi Edina Rasi. This is official Kremlin website. They published picture of Oleg Kashin with stamp to be punished. To be punished. And they explain when he, uh, his legs were broken, when they broke his fingers, and he can't print anymore, right? After that, they even explain why he has to be punished. Well, that's why in this atmosphere, you know, to build successful country is absolutely impossible. They don't want to investigate such kind of corruption case. Of course, we have a very weak state. We have not enough professional investigators who are involved in such kind of anti-corruption cases, etc. But there is no political will at all. Because this is a fundamental principle of the system. Thank you very much. Uh, you are an expert on Ukraine. You have been advisor to President Yushchenko. And I would like to know how you assess the developments in Ukraine how you see the uh, future of Ukrainian-Russian relations. And a short comment. Some observers say that the honeymoon in bilateral relationship is nearing its end. And they see the manifestation of that latest clip shown on 31st October on first channel of Russian TV with uh, you know, severe criticism of President Yanukovych, prime time. I know, I know. You know, I know about this clip. Yeah. Okay, so it's just uh, at the same time, the uh, expectations of Russia from President Yanukovych have not been realized. In fact, no custom union, no merger of uh, Naftogaz and Gazprom, and uh, some other developments. So 
in general, are you optimistic about Ukraine? And what is your vision of Ukrainian-Russian relationship for the future? Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I like Ukraine very much. <laughs> this is really great nation, great people. I spent absolutely excited time during the Orange Revolution. Well, and I protected uh, not Yushchenko and Timoshenko, but freedom and democracy in Ukraine. I want to tell you that I am Russian patriot, not Ukrainian, and I'm Russian citizen. But I believe that success of democratic Ukraine means a success of Russia, and show that Russia can do the same, because Ukrainian society is very close to us culturally, historically, and we have real great economic relationship with each other. That's why uh, I was very optimistic in 2004, uh, and I believe that they move not immediately, but step by step to the right direction. Unfortunately, the way to freedom and progress and success life uh, is very, very difficult, like a spring road in countryside place in the village in some Siberian area or in Ukrainian area. This is a very long way. And unfortunately, problem of, corruptions, of corruption exists in the country, like in Russia. Unfortunately, if you look at the Transparency International statistics, you know, we are very close to each other. Russia among African countries, 140, 154 places very close to Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone and Niger. And Ukraine, unfortunately, is very close to us. Congratulations, right? <laughs> one, well, one, one thirty-seven. This is, uh, frankly, I think that this is the same because I, I had experience in Moscow and in Kiev. You know, wow. I explain what's the difference between corruption in Russia and in Ukraine, if you want. If you gave bribe to Russian bureaucrats, he will do something. If you gave bribe to Ukrainian, he'll do nothing. <laughs> That's a difference, main difference, right? Well, uh, well, what's happened now? <clears throat> what's happened now? Of course, Yanukovych wants to be Ukrainian Putin. Frankly, this is disaster for Ukraine. Um, I explain you why. Because this is corruption, even more than you have now. The uh, difference between Russia and Ukraine is that Ukrainian people uh, have no so, so strong empire mentality like Russians. And they do not so admire about the power at all. Nevertheless, uh, regardless who is in the office, in Bankova, you know, Yushchenko, Timoshenko, or Yanukovych. Uh, well, I watched such kind of phenomena many, many times. You know, for example, if uh, Putin came to the uh, office, you know, everybody immediately stood up, applauded, <laughs> etc. If the same thing happened in Kiev, well, people will maybe look at him, but without admiration, which is good news. Well, uh, second. Um, there is a problem of um, political tension between East and West of Ukraine. And this problem uh, is important. On the other hand, this is a guarantee and insurance for democratic development. Look more attentively what's happened in the last regional elections in Ukraine in October 31, right? This is very, very uh, sunny in the election. Very sunny. What we have, uh, generally the uh, region's party, party of Yanukovych won, generally. But if you look more attentively on the regions, um, the great result got nationalists. Party Svoboda, right? This is real nationalist. This is not Yushchenko, and this is not, you know, Timoshenko. This is real nationalist. Why it's happened? Because Yanukovych pay 
no attention to the problem of the western part of Ukraine. That's why immediately nationalists raise their popularity, etc. And I think that such kind of development will be continued. Honeymoon, honeymoon with Russia. In rhetorics, yes, we had honeymoon. But I think that this is just a sim symbol that there is a difference between Yushchenko and Yanukovych. If you look even for the contract Black uh, Sea Fleet to gas, right? This is a tragedy for Russian budget, first of all, I want to tell you. This is really a tragedy. We have to pay $40 billion for a museum of Russian fleet. $40 billion, $4 billion per year, right? If you compare this amount of money with Okinawa Navy base, which is the hugest Navy base in the world, Americans pay $800 million, not for museum, for very important strategic base, right? We pay $4 billion for Black Sea Fleet. This fleet will never use uh, against NATO, of course, because of Bosphor. Bosphor is under control of Turkey. That's why the only opportunity is to use this fleet against Georgia. Right? Are we ready to pay $4 billion to fight with superpower Georgia? <laughs> Are we ready? Well, it was a successful story in uh, Putin, in Putin uh, TV, that's true. But I think that this is a victory of Yanukovych. I know that it was scandal in Rada. It was like football f funds, you know, they use fired, etc. But uh, Yanukovych won. And now he faced a lot of economic problems. First of all, budget deficit, huge. And he signed an agreement with IMF. And he promised IMF officials that he increased pension age. I want to tell you that to increase pension age means to finish your career in our countries. Well, that's why his popularity dropped down, and I think that it will be continued. Second, he reduced prices for gas because of this Black Sea contract. But Six months later, he increased communal tariffs 50%. Ukrainian people were shocked. They asked, look, you promised us that everything will be great, but what's happened now? Well, uh, as far as the relationship is concerned, Putin wants to establish control in, on some uh, sectors of Ukrainian economy. I am for investment, for Russian investment to Ukraine. I supported that very much. I think that this is great, but not Putin investment private investment. Of course, Ukrainian society is very afraid that to establish control on gas system, gas pipeline system of Ukraine means to lose independence. Maybe in the United States control of pipeline is not a symbol of independence. I hope so. But as far as Ukraine is concerned, they believe that independence of ga gas uh, pipeline system and transportation system is a symbol of independence. I don't think that Yanukovych is ready to do this. I don't think that he's ready to lose control on railways or uh, nuclear energy system, etc. I don't think so. What is important that behind him there are a lot of Ukrainian oligarchs. Oligarchs are very afraid of competition. That's why if you look at very concrete investment to Ukrainian economy from Russian side, unfortunately, there are no a lot of examples because these people around him don't like that. Yushchenko was better in this point of view because there were no oligarchs around him at all. Maybe millionaires, but not billionaires. Around Yanukovych, billionaires. Well, the future. I think that um, rhetorics will be quite good in the future. But uh, the strong unification of relationship, I don't think so. I don't think that it's happened. 
For example, uh, Ukraine is a member of WTO, and to join Tamojane Soyuz, what does it mean with WTO if Russia is not? That's why I don't think that he is ready to do this. And the last point, to be the president of the United Ukraine, means to pay attention to public opinion in the West and in the, in the middle of the country. And I believe that Yanukovych, well, he is not Socrates, of course, but I believe that he understands that. That's, it's very, that's why to be more compromising is the only policy. I think that two-way policy to look to European Union and to have friendly relationship with Russia is what uh, in the interest of Russian Federation and Ukraine. Uh, John Reuter, I'm a postdoc at the Harriman Institute. Um, I'd like to ask you another question about Solidarity's participation in the Duma elections. You've already mentioned that Solidarity is likely to um, face some trouble being registered as a political party. If Solidarity is registered, how well do you think the party can do? What percent of the vote? And related to that, how, given the constraints that opposition parties face in Russia, how can Solidarity attract good candidates that are going to appeal to voters in the regions on the ballot? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when we organize coalition, uh, Levada Center, the most influential and powerful uh, public opinion center in Russia, they investigated uh, this, your, uh, this problem. What is our potential? An answer is very promising for us, about 19%. They said, we are in the fifth place after the United Russia, after communists, after just Russia, and uh, after Zhirinovsky. And we are just a few months in life. <laughs> That's why it's not a bad result. As far as uh, presidential candidate, um, we understand that this is not real elections. But the uh, main idea is to suggest new policy for Russia new strategy for Russia. That's why, regardless who will be the, who will be nominated, right, in this Congress, I think that the only way is to travel, to talk with people, to take part in the, some street activity, to use internet, to use such kind of uh, documents, etc. This is the only way. That's why we want to nominate these gentlemen one year before elections, because we have no opportunity for, uh, to, to use TV. Well, um, on the other hand, if uh, Putin, Surkov, rejects uh, our candidate, which happened, for example, with Kasyanov in 2007, well, I think that it showed the world, and Russians first of all, that this is not an election. What is it? This is selection. Two guys meet each other and decide who will be the next, you know. And Russian people are so stupid that they can't make any decisions. <laughs> and Ranik, when I'm talking about stupid Russian people, I don't think, first of all, about you. <laughs> and, sec and, second and secondly, about Russian people. This is a view of Putin and Medvedev. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dmitry Virovitz. Uh, Boris Efimovich, uh, it's a very close question to just, uh, you, you partially answer it, but uh, let's pretend you guys, four of you, will win the election. Okay? How are you going to manage be between four of you, this part of you, four of you pretty popular and strong personalities? How do you think you can? Well, we agreed with each other that regardless who will win, the rest will be a member of the team. This is really great news. Member of the team, right? To be in the same team, to promote our ideas together, to help each other, etc. This is a part of our agreement. This is important. Because mainly what's happened with Democrats, you know, if somebody became a candidate, the rest think, no, forget about him. He's terrible. Well, that's why now we decided to change. Andranik, yeah, of course. You know. I feel Moscow debates many yeah, no. years ago. Uh, I think 
when I was a student, there was a proverb or some saying, don't trouble trouble until trouble troubles you. <laughs> I didn't force you to touch me and to, <laughs> to force me to come up to the mic microphone. Uh, I think that might be I need to make a couple of comments, otherwise the people would like, will, will think that really things are that bad in Russia as you tried to portray it. I know uh, Boris for more than 20 years. We had a lot of discussions, practically never agreed on any issue, but it uh, didn't make us, uh, you know, um, enemies or, I don't know, didn't create any uh, bad relations. We are keeping good relations and we have sympathy to each other. That's why uh, not everything is that bad as one could think, which means we have some democracy, we can disagree, but at the same time keep human relations. But I would like to make two comments which is important at least for the people to understand that what you are trying to show it's not that unique it has its history and I just would like to remind you a couple of things first today I read in Sabisednik your interview and your assessment about Viktor Stepanish Chernomerdin you said that this was a nice guy with a good sense of humor uh, with a good will and all these kind of things but you know it depends what is your personal attitude towards the person you could take another I would like to remind you another thing concerning this guy in 93 or 94 uh, newspaper is Vestia published reprinted from Forbes his assets and his wealth which was at that time four billion dollars. After that, uh, Chernomirzin called to Alek Perov, look what was the owner of his Vestia, and this Vestia was destroyed. Galimbiovsky with his team, Lazis and others, all these liberals, they were kicked out because they dared to mention that state employee uh, never being in business had four billion uh, amount of wealth, which means the corruption goes back to the period when just the process of privatization started in Russia, which means the first, the biggest corrupted person was the prime minister, and you served as his deputy Position in government. Second, yeah. uh, Boris, yeah. the most scandalous auction were trillions or at least multi-billion property of state gave away for nothing and all these billionaires and oligarchs emerged. It happened when you and Chubais were in government and you organized these auctions and for nothing these people became billionaires, which means nothing new under this sun, you know. Corruption was under Yeltsin, under Chernomerdin, under your government, and you are trying to show, this is for the sake of justice, I just wanted uh, to show that we know the history. You can't say that from Putin started everything. Nobody knew the name of Putin when all these oligarchs, all this corruption, an enormous amount of corruption flourished in our country. Great. And a lot of journalists were killed. And first guy who was killed from Moskovsky comes I just forgot his Holodov. name. Yeah. Uh, which means, you know, for the sake of justice, again, I wanted to say that this is nothing new. And that's why your attempt to show that Putin and corruption are equal proves that really, though you said that nothing personal, it is very personal for you, Boris. And this is your weakest point. Unfortunately, really, we have corruption, we have all these problems, but you are too personal, and this is the weakest point of you. And unfortunately, having all the accesses to media, to money, to everything, you couldn't, you know, inspire the people. And you, it's good that you are in Russian politics, but this is very marginal 
part of Russian politics, but even being very marginal, you must be there. We need you in Russian politics. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Andronik is a famous Russian politologist, but he forgets history. Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, he forgets. I want to tell you, Andronik, I was a governor from 91 up to 97, and I became a member of the government in March 97. Loans for shares privatization, which you mentioned, stopped in 96. That's why in 97 there were just one auction for Svezinvest. Just one, which was absolutely transparent, absolutely honest, with huge scandal with Berezovsky, with huge scandal with Gusinsky, but we won and we organized and it was my achievement, first of all, because my main uh, idea to Yeltsin when he invited me to be a first deputy prime minister, he asked me, do you have a program, what should be done? Our response, yes. We have to nationalize Kremlin, Mr. President, because Kremlin was privatized. And I don't want to work in the country of bandit capitalism. It was my sentence. Maybe you remember about that. That's why when you mention that I was involved in loans for shares privatization, this is a lie. It's the first point. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a first. This is a lie. Second point, as far as Chernobyl murder is concerned. Yes, information about his billions of dollars appeared at that time. That's true. But I want to tell you that when we published with Milov our report, Putin and Gazprom, maybe you know about that, report named Putin and Gazprom, we founded shares which disappeared in Chernomerian time. These shares are in the hand of Kovalchuk. Uh, moreover, when I was the first deputy prime minister, I stopped very criminal and very corrupted trust agreement between Vyakhirev and the government about 38% of the shares in the hand of Chernoman, maybe you, uh, or of Vyakhirev, maybe you remember that. Calculation which Forbes did based on the fact that this 38% of Gazprom shares belong to Chernoman. I want to tell you that in the end of 97 this trust agreement was cancelled in the end of 97 and description of this case of cancelling of this corrupted agreement exists in all of the information including after uh, the death of Viktor Stepanovich that's why this is not true information third point, we had a lot of problems with Chernobyl but you know Russian tradition if somebody died you don't ask that he was terrible guy, he was idiot or somebody else, right? And he uh, information about billions of dollars appeared in uh, as far as journalists' deaths are concerned. You are right. Journalists um, during the last ten years, more than hundred journalists were killed, and a lot of journalists were killed in 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 nineties. That's true, but there is a little difference. I explain you. When, when murders killed Listiv, maybe you remember what was Yeltsin's response. Yeltsin came to Astankina and cried. With his journalist team, he cried. When Anna Politkovska was killed, Putin said that he gave us damage, her death gave us damage more than her critical articles. What's happened? with politician in this country if he will use such kind of sentence after death of the journalist. What's happened with, with such kind of politician? Do you <laughs> feel some differences between Yeltsin and Putin, even in this point of view? That's why you are not right. And Alek Kashin, once again, this case, terrible tragedy, happened just at the beginning of November, right? What's happened with investigators? Who is responsible for that? You know, we Вставание с колен уже случилось. Где убийцы? А тогда страны не было. I explain you. If you compare the end of 20th century 
Russia was on the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Soviet Union were bankrupt. And Russian state was really very weak because oil prices were ten dollars. Now we have eighty-five. What's happened? Who's responsible for Anna Politkovska? For for years uh, passed from that, right? Paul Khlebnikov and now Oleg Kashin. Who will find, who will do something in this point of view? Nothing. I explain you what's the difference. Putin believes that journalists are enemies. Yes, he believes in that. Or spies, maybe. Yes, he believes in that. And Yeltsin was a creator of freedom of speech. Putin is a creator of censorship. And Yeltsin is a creator of freedom of speech. I, you know, I know Yeltsin very well. I wrote several books about him. I want to tell you just one example. What's the difference between Putin office and Kremlin and Yeltsin? When I came to Yeltsin office, he had just one pen on the table. And he said that this is a symbol of the power. When I came to Putin office, he got special device to switch on TV. TV appeared. And we talked with him, and he always watched TV. Another example, when uh, we spent some time with, with Yeltsin, he asked me, let's watch Programa Vremia. I do it. It was Berezovsky and Derenko time. Maybe you remember about that. And from the first second, it was huge scandal against Yeltsin. And Yeltsin sit down with me and look. One minute, ten minutes, after that he has Boris, switch off. That's why we protect freedom of speech. When you ask, when you ask that the, uh, the, the that Gazeta Izvestia was closed because Chernomerdian information appeared, etc., I want to tell you that in 90s we were free press. We had free press. This is true. We have live show. We have Savik Shuster. We have Evgeny Kiselyov. We have Leonid Parfenov. We have Svetlana Sorokina. Now we have Savik Shuster in Kiev. Evgeny Kiselyov in Kiev. No live show at all and blacklists. And I'm one of the first. This is true. I understand that Russians who are around, they understand what we are talking about. That's why I, you, you have great position, state position, and you have to protect Putin. I understand that. This is your job. But on the other hand, I think... You protect your position. I understand, you know? Well, no, no, no. I, I want. To, I, no, that's not true. For example, I explain you why you are not. You are, you are not right once again. In '99, when I was one of the leader. Of, no, no, no. I, I, well, you know, what's the difference? What's what's the difference between Russian people and American? Uh, American, if they mention something, they are responsible for that. Unfortunately, a lot of Russians, they have no ideas about their speeches and words. I think that this is terrible. For example, Medvedev said, freedom is better than non-freedom. In Washington, D.C., everybody applauded us. That's great, you know, that's really true. Freedom is not non-freedom. After that, Khodorkovsky is in the prison forever. Like Medvedev promised. You know, that's why I think that you have to respond for, for your own sentences. Well, uh, and uh, about personal. Well, uh, in 99, I want to tell you, when SPS came on the elections, it was a slogan. Putin of Presidente, Kirienko of Duma. Maybe you remember about that, right? I was against Putin at that time. Not because I was success and he was success. Because of another reason. Because he's KGB. That's a point. And my mother told me that never trust KGB. This is my mother idea, not mine. Well, never trust K That's why I was against. But Chubais, Gaidar, Kiryenka, they supported Putin. Finally, I said, okay, if you support it, no problem. I'm ready to support. That's why in 99, I, I did nothing to criticize Putin. 
because they explained that he worked with Sobchak, that he worked with Yeltsin, and he nominated by Yeltsin, and Yeltsin, you know, he's a Democrat, etc., blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, guys, let's wait. I sit still, do nothing. That's why nothing personal. Personal, uh, because if it was personal, I was against him in 99, but I didn't. Hi, my name is Valerie. I'm a third-year student here at the college. Uh, uh, you've discussed greatly the dangers that Putinism to, po poses towards Russian society. So I was wondering if you could discuss also the dangers that Putin's, uh, Putinism poses to its neighboring nations. Um, I, I would uh, love for you to comment on the war in 2000. What country are you from? I'm from Georgia. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. So if you <laughs> <laughs> if you could uh, if you could comment on. Uh, I, I would, I'm curious to what your positions are towards Georgia and uh, the separatist regions. Yeah. The your president radiated from Colombia, as far as I know. Uh, yeah. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Well, are you his son or no? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first of all, my 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 position about Georgia and neighbors. We have terrible foreign policy with neighbors. We have a lot of enemies around Russian border. Superpower Georgia, superpower Estonia, and Baltic states, now superpower Belarus, and in the near past, superpower Ukraine. All of them are Putin enemies, which is disaster. You know, you have one enemy, for example, the U.S. has enemy like Iran. It's understandable, and there is explanation why. But if everybody is your enemy, look at your face in the mirror. Maybe something happened with you. Maybe, right? It's a first general uh, understanding, as far as Georgian problems are concerned. Uh, I don't think that your president is angel. I think that sometimes he looks like Putin. Maybe better, a little, but like. Well, if you look at the war situation in 2008, I think that both were responsible for that, including Mikhail Nikolaevich. Second, I think that recognition of Ossetia and Abkhazia is great Russian mistake. Because of domestic reasons, I want to tell you what I'm, uh, I'm thinking about that. We have problem of separatism in Russia, huge problem. In North Caucasus republics, for example, in Gushetia, Chechnya, Karachayev, Cherkesi, kabardino balkaria Dagestan, a lot of separatists and extremists want to build independent states in this area. What does it mean to recognize Ossetia and Abkhazia for these extremists and separatists? This is a great example to do the same. That's why this is a real threat to the unity of Russian Federation. This is a threat for us. Moreover, they talked a lot about unity of Georgia. Yes. Russia voted for the United Russian resolution about that. That's why, of course, and finally, what is this country, South Ossetia? Who rules this country? Russia spent billions of rubles and hundred millions of dollars to reconstruct this republic. Nothing happened. Money disappeared. Kakoite is one of the most corrupted men in the North Caucasus. Who is responsible for this money? We have no roads in the country. We have poor people, millions and millions. We spend billions of dollars in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Do you think that this is a good idea? I don't. I know about great tensions between Abkhazian people and Georgia. And this is a problem like in Yugoslavia. It's, it's, it's very clear. I don't think that to solve a problem of unification of Georgia is a simple task. This is very difficult. But to recognize this republic means, first of all, give a signal to separatists in Russian Federation to do the same, and secondly, 
to forget about Russian budget money. We spend more than six billion dollars to support uh, North Republics, North Caucasus Republics. Six billion. I believe that if we spend so much money to them, it will be very safe situation in Caucasus and in the rest of the country. What we have now. Putin promised us Zamachit Sartiri. Do you remember that? Zamachit Sartiri terroristov. He promised us to do this in 2000. In 2000, it was one, it was 135 terroristic act in Russia, huge amount. One, 135. Ten years later, in 2009, six times more. We have two terroristic acts per day in Russian Federation. Nobody even pay attention on that because it's happened twice a day. That's why, unfortunately, we lose these republics, paying them billions of dollars. And on the other hand, we recognize two republics and spend additional money. I think that this is absolutely anti-Russian decision. And, of course, finally, I hope that this, uh, this mistake will be changed. We will drink something, yeah. <laughs> That's fine idea. Fine idea. Great. Uh, <laughs> Vladimir Yuzhakov, Columbia Business School. Uh, my, just a quick question. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about the role of uh, Medvedev in Russian politics? This is, this is, this is the most mystical question in our country. Who is Mr. Medvedev, you know? We had the same question 10 years ago with Putin. Now we know very correct answer. Um, everybody knows, but Medvedev, first of all, he has a problem. He was not elected. He was selected. Uh, it's the first point. Second, he was selected not because he's professional, strong, and energetic leader, but because he's loyal and weak. That's why this separation happened because of these two reasons, which is against Russian interests, of course. Next point, double power system or tandem. I don't know such kind of peaceful example in the history of Russia. I don't know. Conflicts always happen. Or smutne vreme, something like that. Well, uh, but he was so weak that since... 2008, nothing serious happened as far as power is concerned. Um, if you ask me this question, for example, two years ago, I respond that he has no chance to be in the office after 2012. Now I think that he has 10% of chance. 10%. And he wants very much. And I talked with Michael McFall, who met him a few days ago in Japan, and he said he agreed that he wants very much. For every person in the world, if you want something, this is very important. Well, well, how to be the president and how to run? I have an idea for Mr. Medvedev. Good idea for him. I mean Khodorkovsky. I think that if Khodorkovsky will be free, it will be the year of Putin. Because Putin will be involved in discussion with Khodorkovsky, corruption, disappearance of property, violation of law, Hamomnichiski suit, Basmanli suit, etc. Now we face very dramatic time. In December 15, uh, Judge Danilkin will proclaim a decision about Khodorkovsky. Prosecutors insisted him to stay in the prison for 14 years, years additionally, which is sadism. You know, I met him, I visited Hamomnitsky court several times and I want to tell you that 
he is really a very brave man. I was not sure in that before, but he is brilliant, brave, and talented man. And he changed, and his mind changed very much after these seven years. People does not believe that he is still oligarch. He is a victim. And a lot of Russian people who even hate oligarchs, they believe that he is a victim and he is a hope. A lot. Well, I think that if Khodorkovsky will be free, this is additional chance to Medvedev will run in campaign and win. Additional chance. I believe that Putin knows that too. And unfortunately, I don't think that he has enough strength and enough will to sign just one decree to make him free. According to the Russian Constitution, the president has such kind of responsibility to give him freedom. He has, like American president, absolutely the same. But I'm afraid that you have to be more stronger, more powerful to do this. And this is a real chance for Medvedev, I'm sure. Uh, Putin has a Sikh, Khadarafabia. He believes that Khadarkovsky is like bin Laden. He destroyed his life, he will lose freedom, he will lose property, and he will lose power if Khodorkovsky will be um, free. That's why I think this opportunity is very important. And we will understand what does it mean reset and what does it mean rules of law in understanding of Mr. Medvedev in December 15. It will be very clear for everybody. Very little, uh, real quick comment. Uh, in your altercation uh, here, uh, discussion. Discussion. discussion, discussion, no altercation. You just proved one point, which was uh, originally, and I would quote Dostoevsky. Uh, если попытаться выразить одним словом то, что происходит в России, нужно сказать воруют. Meaning Karamzin. Karamzin. Я извиняюсь. Да кто только не говорил. Это говори. So. <laughs> what happens in Russia is they are stealing. So there's nothing new in that. And you, you are in agreement on that point. But that is a comment. I just wanted you, skipping uh, around the periphery of Russia, you mentioned uh, the next uh, big enemy, Belarus. So there is a uh, Belarusian opposition. Uh, you are uh, representing Russian opposition. Is there any cooperation and is there any hope of uh, demo democratic cooperation between both? Well. Just one comment about corruption and about Karamzin and Dostoevsky and everybody. Well, now we have now we have absolutely uh, we can compare right situation in, for example, in our time and ten years ago. Uh, looking at Transparency International, Russia was in the 85 place in the end of 20th century. Now we are in the 154. Worse, worse, and worse. Trend is important. Trend is decline. That's important. And the reason why it's happened, because of censorship, because of very close elite, without any competition, because the one-party system, in fact, no competition, you know, big absence of election. And, uh, of course, in this situation, in this closed society, corruption arises. Nevertheless, uh, regardless of what, uh, what you want to do. Belarus. Uh, I think that, first of all, Putin and Lukashenko are brothers. They hate each other. Sometimes it's happened in the family. Well, but they're brothers. Well, that's why the best way for two countries is to forget about these two gentlemen. Second point, I have great relationship with Belarus opposition, with Anatoly Lebedko, for example, from the United Civil Party. The problem of Belar Belarus opposition is uh, dispersion and opposition is split. That's why there are a lot of candidates in upcoming elections in December. That's why Lukashenko, of course, he'll, he, he will lose popularity, and which is good. But, you know, to have a real strong opposition candidate, you have to, to, to choose one. They didn't. 
They talked a lot about that, but they didn't. I think that this is a strategy. And frankly, Belarus' uh, perspective looks much more, um, I can say, uh, better than Ukrainian and Russian. Small country without xenophobes, uh, with uh, good infrastructure, without very strong tension inside the society. I'm sure that regardless who will be the next, this this country will be European, a member of EU. For EU, it's nothing, 10 millions of people. This is a small country without any problems. That's why the only problem is Lukashenko. Well, Putin hates Lukashenko, and uh, I think that he will not recognize an election in Belarus, and he will say that this is fraud. It will. I'm sure that this is true, first of all. But when Putin will say it in such a way, nobody trusts him, because we have absolutely the same. That's why, uh, and I think that his strategy is to proclaim that he uh, will will be elected in in the fraud elections. That's why we do not to connect with him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, and the West will do the same. The same, and uh, relationship between two countries will be worse and worse and worse. But I want to tell you that Russian um, government, including Yeltsin, I agree, was sponsored of Luk- the Lukashenko dictatorship. Cheap gas, cheap oil, you know, they, he spent a lot of money for KGB, you know, to, to destroy opposition, uh, to organize a lot of uh, terrible things against journalists, etc., disappearance of the people. Well, and Russia supported this. And this is terrible result of such kind of policy. What is good that now Putin understands that to support Lukashenko means to support anti-Russian leader, which is very good news. I tried to explain him 10 years ago about that. 10 years ago, I asked that he is the most anti-Russian leader in the world. He use your money and hate you. Well, that's why I think that this election campaign is a problem for Belarus opposition, but I hope that maybe next will be better. We have to disappear. Yeah, we <laughs> First, I want to thank you to Super Modern Russia uh, uh, for helping to sponsor the event. I want to thank uh, everybody for coming. We had a great turnout. And I especially want to thank, of course, Dimsov for giving such an uh, enlightening talk on contemporary uh, issues in Russia. So please join me in giving a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, sir.